So we're standing here in my living room in uh, Tokyo, Japan, and I'm gonna show everybody just how amazing Bitcoin is by sending 100 euros worth of Bitcoin as of today's value through my TV, onto the camera, onto the TV in the Netherlands, and anybody with their Bitcoin wallet ready that scans what they're gonna see on the screen in a moment will be able to claim the 100 euros worth of Bitcoins. And there's nothing that anybody can do to stop it or to freeze your account or block it or control it in any way. So on the TV here, we have a Bitcoin address that I've just generated. And I have my phone here. I'm gonna scan the QR code for the Bitcoin address on the TV. Now I have it. I'm gonna send 100 euros worth of Bitcoins to that address. So we'll hit send. And anybody can monitor on blockchain.info the balance of this address. There it is, 100 euros worth of Bitcoins just arrived at this address. So total received, 100 euros. Final balance, 100 euros. Just like that. So on this next screen you're about to see, anybody with their Bitcoin wallet that scans the private key that corresponds with that address will be able to uh, claim that money just by scanning the code that you're about to see on your television. So if you want to take a look, here it comes, 100 euros ready for anyone to claim. All you have to do is scan this one right here, and uh, it's 100 euros worth of Bitcoins as of today. By the time you scan it, it might be worth even more. So there it is for anyone ready to claim with their Bitcoin wallet. Okay, Holland, now you've just seen the power of Bitcoin. I sent 100 euros worth of Bitcoin from here in Tokyo directly to you guys through this camera, through the network, through the TV, right into your home. If I had tried to do that, send you the money with a traditional bank, it would have taken several days and probably cost 30 euros. I just did it right now with Bitcoin instantly, basically for free and didn't have to ask anybody for permission. I didn't need a bank, I didn't need a government, I didn't need anybody. I just needed myself and you and our smartphones to do it. That's the power of Bitcoin. This is Backlight. Welcome to a world in which we can be our own bank. We take it for granted that money creation is controlled by governments and banks. But there's a community of people who don't see this as a given and who get quite worked up about it. The Wall Street is fraud, America is fraud, the world is fraud, banks are fraud, central banks are fraud. We live in an era of fraud. It's all based on fraud and they get a percentage of the fraud. That's the business model. To suggest that there is any moral or ethical aspect to anything that's going on now is to be completely naive about the fact that we live in an era dominated by financial terrorists. Terrorists, terrorists, jihadis of banking. They're here to kill you and themselves. They believe in an ideology, not the Koran, but Adam Smith, that they completely misread and interpret as something to justify their blowing themselves up. Jenny Yellen's a terrorist! Mario Draghi's a terrorist! The Central Bank of Japan is a terrorist! These are the real terrorists! Funds received. This community is switching to what they think is a better monetary system. A system in which banks are no longer needed because payments could be made directly from one person to another. In a system of debt, one of the two parties is always the slave. And that is the architecture of money we live in. That is the architecture of money we use in our civilization. An architecture of money where you have no control. An architecture of money where every interaction is mediated by a third party. A third party that has absolute control over that money. Bitcoin is fundamentally different because in Bitcoin you don't owe anyone anything and no one owes you anything. It is not a system based on debt. It is a system based on ownership and no one can censor it, no one can seize it, no one can freeze it. And what they will tell you is that they're worried. They're very worried. They're worried that criminals will use Bitcoin. But the truth is that they're far more terrified than all of the rest of us will. Thank you. Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency that was mostly known as a convenient tool for criminals, has suddenly become an important topic at conferences on financial innovation all over the world. Proponents speak passionately of a digital miracle that can save the world from financial ruin. The Bitcoin story starts off like a gospel revelation. It's November the 2nd, 2008, just six weeks after the Lehman Brothers collapse, and all over the world there are panicked debates about how to save the banks. 
Then, on a little visited web forum for cryptographers, a document appears in which a completely new monetary system is proposed. The visionary author calls himself Satoshi Nakamoto. First time I heard about it, I was at lunch with a buddy in Texas, and uh, he said, man, there's this crazy new money. And so we talked about it over lunch, and then I went home and I said, man, I wanna, I wanna see if I can buy some. At first, I wanted to buy some. I emailed a friend of mine. I think I, I probably saw the white paper in some web forum or something. You know, it just said, this is some electronic currency thing. And this was publicly available. You know, this was posted, uh, I think, December, you know, 2008 or something. And these were the darkest days of the financial crisis. So that to me suggests a very clever mind uh, that saw an opportunity, the perfect opportunity to introduce a new radical technology and a new radical approach to money and finance at just the right moment when people would be very open to making this big shift that's required to adopt a new currency. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure Satoshi is a human being, although I'd really love to go find out that he was some advanced AI. But 99.99% .99 chance he was a human being. What's exciting for me is like a global economy. Right now we say we have a global economy, but I can't take a dollar and give it to you in the Netherlands and then you know what to do with it, right? You would have to go and change it to your native currency. Um, and when you kind of eliminate that step and I can just send you one form of payment and you can send me a product in a matter of seconds, that starts to change things from a, from a global perspective, so. The first wire that I sent was uh, for $25,000. And uh, this was in early 2011, and Bitcoins were somewhere around a dollar. All the way along, I was buying Bitcoin, and uh, any time I managed to earn some dollars for my other company, uh, I put it into Bitcoin. And at this point, the vast majority of uh, my net worth, I've been keeping in Bitcoin for a while now. I'm glad you didn't get the parking pin. The car is actually like the perfect color for Bitcoin. It's like the Bitcoin orange. So we wanted to order some like Bitcoin decals and put like Bitcoin logos around the car and then drive it around Tokyo to help, help advertise Bitcoin, but still never got around to doing that, maybe someday. Roger Fear is the CEO of MemoryDealers.com, selling secondhand computer equipment. But for a couple of years now, he's been known as the Bitcoin Jesus. In 2011, he bought $25,000 worth of Bitcoins, which now have a market value of $6 million. And somebody closed my, uh... I usually leave the trunk, uh, the hood open a little bit so that I can reconnect the battery, but I don't know how it got closed between now and the last time I was here, so we'll have to, uh... Some people think of Bitcoin as sort of an early adopter thing, like, okay, I'm already too late, or... So isn't that a problem for Bitcoin? So thinking that, that it's too late to get involved in Bitcoin is like thinking it's too late to get involved with the internet or too late to get involved with using a cell phone. Like, it's not too late to get involved in Bitcoin. Bitcoin's gonna make your life easier in so many ways. And, and the price of Bitcoin too, it's not too late for that either. Bitcoin's like $270 a Bitcoin right now. If Bitcoin becomes really popular all over the world, Bitcoins are gonna have to be worth at least tens of thousands of dollars a Bitcoin, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars per, per Bitcoin. So thinking it's too late to get involved with, with Bitcoin is like thinking it's too late to get involved with, with using the internet. Of course not. Like it, it's ubiquitous in our lives and Bitcoin's gonna become ubiquitous in our lives as well. Perfect money should be, have a limited supply. That's one of the most important things. It needs to have a limited supply. It needs to be easily recognizable. It needs to be durable. It needs to be transportable. Bitcoin has all of those things better than any other form of money the world has ever seen. And that's why when I noticed Bitcoin for the first time, I realized that it's so incredibly useful as money that people are gonna start using it more and more. Roger lives and works in Tokyo. He's outsourcing all the work for his own company so he can spend all his time promoting Bitcoin. So it's a pretty exciting time for Bitcoin right now with all the stuff going on in, uh, in Greek. I mean, Bitcoin's up about $10 since yesterday, just uh, since all the news on the Greek, Greek referendum vote and just every day in Bitcoin is so exciting. So and you can see, you know, lots of trading and everything just in the last uh, 24 hours there. 
I paid to put up a billboard in the heart of Silicon Valley, right next to one of the busiest expressways. It just said, we accept Bitcoin, memorydealers.com, and then listed some of the parts that we sell. But then after that, I started paying for uh, national radio ads in the United States that were on more than 100 radio stations across the United States, and paid for that for a couple of years. OK Wave, a popular consumer website in Japan, will accept Bitcoins from now on. At a press conference, Roger Fear helps them spread the word. But today, one Bitcoin is San Man Gosen in. Like a Bitcoin, say, Kai Chun in Kini Natara, Zittai, Nam Piakaman in Toka Nansen Man in Naru, Naranaki Deva Naranai, Zittai, Bitcoin one in Kini Natara. Roger San Karasetsme, Oste Tarakimas no de, Roger San, Zehi, and Biko, Kosetsme, Tarakereva to Moimas. いいものにはこういうことがあるんだけど、あのナトリーさんは私よりに本語うまいだから日本人だから、これはちょっと難しいことだから説明してくる聞いてくれませんか。あのまあすごいあのお金にはすごい様々なこう役割があるんですけれども
I said, oh, you know, I'm just running some computers. And she walks up there and, you know, you see 50 graphics cards all running at the same time. And it's very hot. And she's like, okay, you got to you gotta get out of here. You got to figure something else out because it is too hot. Hey, what's up, Nerdgasm fans? Jerry here, a.k.a. Barnacles. I'm here with Marshall Long from at Final Hash. Now, we're out here in, I would say, what's going to be the largest Bitcoin mine in North America. And it's realistically an actual mining operation. Like, you can pretty much attribute everything that's going on here to, gold to like, mining. a real gold mining operation. It's like you have heavy equipment, you have cost, you have fuel costs, yep. and you have recovery. Everything. That you then go and sell and turn into real money. That's right. A Bitcoin is the reward for solving complex mathematical puzzles, and Bitcoin miners let their computers work day and night to complete these tasks. All the Bitcoin users in the world are connected, and together they constitute a network that processes and checks all Bitcoin transactions in a public ledger called the blockchain, and Satoshi Nakamoto designed it in such a way that users can create a free and anonymous Bitcoin account number, a so-called wallet. Satoshi's invention eliminates the need for a central bank, because all the users together are the bank. But early Bitcoin users had no idea how big Bitcoin and the blockchain would become. I think sometime in spring of 2010, I could be wrong on the exact dates, but basically uh, someone put out a, a request saying, hey, I'd like to buy something with Bitcoin. Will anyone uh, buy me a pizza? And I believe someone here in England uh, bought the, the person in Florida a pizza uh, for 10,000 or something bitcoins. I mean, it'd be worth, you know, a very large sum of money today. Uh, and, and that was the first bitcoin commercial transaction. Garrick Heilman, an economist at the London School of Economics, was one of the first scholars to study bitcoin and the blockchain as a serious monetary system. Um, as a scholar, did you sort of label it, or was it something totally new to you? It looked very different to me. I mean, as soon as I heard the word decentralized and the fact there was a network powering this currency rather than a central issuer, that immediately captured my interest as something quite different based on what little I knew about alternative currencies at that time. What it meant for people who are libertarians in particular is that the government couldn't come in and shut down a server and end Bitcoin. It would have to shut down the entire internet or turn off the electricity grid to, to stop Bitcoin. And so that was really attractive to, to people who are worried about these types of things. Many of the early Bitcoin enthusiasts were libertarians who saw Bitcoin as the ultimate remedy for state intervention. This was also what attracted Roger Veer to Bitcoin. In his early 20s, he was a candidate for the Libertarian Party in California. But during his campaign, he was sentenced to 10 months in prison for trafficking illegal fireworks. According to him, this was a political case brought by people who opposed his ideas. So I have uh, two Bitcoin-related geese. I have the Bitcoin.org And I have the blockchain.info, Bitcoin blockchain logo. Do you think it was a political case? There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. And uh, in fact, even at one of the pretrial conference things with the ATF agents, my attorney and the US attorney, uh, my attorney was saying, hey, these are store-bought firecrackers we sold on eBay. We can pay a fine, do some community service and be done with this. There's no reason to destroy my life over it and send me to prison and make me a felon. And the US attorney at that point was kind of nodding his head like that sounds reasonable. And the ATF agent literally pounded his hand on the table and shouted, but you didn't hear the things that he said, which I think summed up very clearly. They weren't mad about anything that I had done. They were mad about the things that I had said because the ideas that I'm trying to spread are 
subversive to the state. And I did 10 months in federal prison and I was scared of the U.S. government. The, the moment I was allowed to leave the U.S., I left, and I haven't lived there ever since. Uh, and they have what's called an exit tax. So at the time you announce you're a United States citizen, they tax you on your entire net worth at capital gains tax rates, and you have to pay them that money. Otherwise, uh, they'll probably either send you to jail or at the very least not let, ever let you back in the country ever again. If you think about it, it's not all that different than slaves from the past having to buy their freedom from the, the plantation owner. Money creation by the state is sort of connected to state aggression for you, right? In, in my line of thinking is if you or I create counterfeit euros or print euros or dollars or yen, we would go to jail for counterfeiting because it's destructive to the economy. By counterfeiting dollars, it's stealing from everybody else in the economy that has money. When governments do the exact same thing, it has the exact same negative effects. The only difference is they call it fancy names like quantitative easing or economic stimulus, but it's destructive for the exact same reasons. My hobby growing up and in high school and, and since has been studying economics. And the more you study economics, the more you realize that all these government interventions in the economy prevent the world from becoming as wealthy and prosperous as it otherwise would become. And suddenly now we have this tool that separates money from state. Like everybody today thinks that separating church and state, yeah, of course they should be separated. But a couple hundred years ago, it was, you know, heresy to say that church and state should be separated. And today it sounds maybe a little bit crazy to say that money and state should be separate. But I think in another decade or two, people are going to think, oh, what the heck were we thinking letting governments be in charge of money? That caused so many problems and so many misallocations of resources around the world. Of course, Bitcoin is, is better. Why is the government and bank's monopoly on money creation seen as undesirable? In his white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto didn't express his opinion on this. But it does seem that he wanted bitcoins to appreciate rather than depreciate, unlike money. He programmed bitcoin in such a way that there's a maximum of 21 million bitcoins to be mined. Bitcoins weren't meant to resemble money, but gold. In November 2013, this dream became reality when one Bitcoin was worth an ounce of gold. The Bitcoin code itself has never been hacked, but in 2014, the customer data of Mt. Gox, an online exchange office, was stolen by hackers, causing the Bitcoin exchange rate to plummet. At the Financial Times in London, journalist Isabella Kaminska has been critically following the Bitcoin exchange rate and community since the very beginning. I've always been a geek about finance and I've always been a geek about how the system works. So like the really boring nuts and bolts, the plumbing of the system. Um, and I think in 2008, it was the first time we all really thought actually not only is this system as, it, as we know it possibly crumbling, there might be opportunities for new systems to come up as a result of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I guess I, I started to, uh, writing about it again around here, 2012. And then we had the first little rally. And then this is also, also class, this is very reminiscent to the classic bubble well, I know um, that you guys want to change the next So you see, one. this is the, uh, this is, the so famous bubble it? chart, it which low, has takeoff, okay. first sell-off, bear that traps, so that's the first little mi mi micro, you know, um, mini dump. Then you go to the new total bubble, then it crashes, and there's a bit of like a return. People think maybe it's going to come back, and then it crashes again, and then it, it gets back to a, a more um, realistic uh, trajectory, and you'll see that that really is very reminiscent <laughs> to what we've seen here. What everyone is really wondering is, will we see a consolidation of this price, or will it yeah. recover somewhat, or will it go completely to zero? Um, there are really. What do you think? Um, I think what's best for Bitcoin is actually if it just stays stable. So everybody agrees volatility yeah, okay. is currently the. Um, the biggest enemy of Bitcoin. Satoshi's dream, what would that be? 
The paper doesn't really say what his big dream was. He just wanted an efficient mechanism that was cheap. Um, but in terms of what I think people have projected his vision as being is this world where we are, our, we are our, all our own bank. We don't have to depend on any intermediary and banks are gone. In the current economy, because of the way our system is structured, if I decide to hoard my dollars, I'm usually holding them in an institution that is using them as a, as a means of capital uh, raising, and they will be lending them out. So my, my money, even though I'm saving, that saving is going into an investment somewhere else, being done by a bank, etc., and it's helping to grow the economy. So my saving doesn't disadvantage the economy. But in Bitcoin, there isn't that that opportunity. So a hoarded Bitcoin is a hoarded Bitcoin. It's totally idle. It has no interest, it has no yield. It is simply sitting there doing nothing. And yet the person who holds on to it thinks they have a right to future income flow as if they had been investing. When the line was flat, people like massively bought in or mined Bitcoins and they are now like multi-millionaire billionaires. They're the new 1%. They're the 1% of, uh, of the Bitcoin economy, which again goes against the whole democratization um, side of, of the argument, because really you're not democratizing the economy. You're just transferring the power from the existing elite to a new elite. The fact that a few early Bitcoin miners and investors are now multi-millionaires is reminiscent of the current banking system in which bankers are accused of personal enrichment. So I got this degree in international development and I was, I was with my dog on this hill um, and I was like, yeah, what could I do? I could go try and work in so I mean, say East Africa, I could try to go and explore economies there and see what's happening, I could try all these things. And then I was like, why don't I just try and break into the financial sector in London? That would actually be really, really fascinating. That'd be really amazing. And then once I had that thought, uh, uh, I couldn't, I mean, I just became obsessed with this idea. Brett Scott is the author of the book Hacking the Future of Money, about reforming the financial sector. To immerse himself in the system he criticised, he worked for two years as a broker in the city of London. We're now in the city. We just passed the border dragon. Oh, yeah, those dragons mark the boundaries of the city of London. So it's the financial district. Cut off all my hair, I bought my first suit. Interestingly enough, I had two interviews with Lehman Brothers, um, literally weeks before they went bust. And I remember being up in the, the sort of like the 35th floor or something, and the guy was like, oh no, everything's fine, everything's fine, you know. <laughs> Don't believe the stories you, you see in the press about us. Uh, and then they went under. If you created an entire society that was reliant on Bitcoin, yeah, you'd have massive problems of inequality. Um, but it's, it's very important in that it, it forms a kind of counterpower to the existing bank payment system. Um, so while I can critique Bitcoin as much as you want, you know, um, I'm always aware that you know, the existing bank system is, is highly flawed. And I, I like the fact that this exists as an alternative. What's happening right now in a lot of the banking scene is this move towards uh, it's called a cashless society. Um, but if you think about what that actually means, it means every single payment that you, you undertake has to go via a commercial bank. Now, that means every single transaction you, you ever do will be monitored and, and recorded in a database somewhere. Um, it means you'll always be giving fees to various uh, you know, uh, credit card companies and so on. So there, there's, um, and there's potential for a huge amount of surveillance. There's all sorts of problems that come with a cashless society. In that world, something like Bitcoin, which is an electronic version of cash, or electronic form of, uh, um, I guess, an electronic equivalent to cash, becomes quite important. It's uh, St. Paul's Cathedral across there, which is um, where the Occupy movement uh, set up camp. London, um, and they were there for a long time. Um, they tried to occupy the London Stock Exchange but weren't able to get in, uh, so they chose St. Paul's instead. You think so. of Bitcoin and the whole movement being as a sort of better form of Occupy? It's a different form of Occupy, you know, it's a, it's a, um, maybe it's a follow-on from the Occupy movement in some ways. 
Bitcoin, as a form of protest against the current banking system, is propagated in the Netherlands by three Bitcoin enthusiasts who have created an app called Bitkassa and who are now trying to convince all retailers in Arnhem to accept Bitcoins. Als ik nu mensen spreek over hoe Bitcoin werkt, dan kijken ze in eerste instantie soms vreemd op van goh, werkt dat zo en wat bijzonder en apart. Maar diezelfde mensen weten ook helemaal niks van hoe het ja, huidige systeem eigenlijk in elkaar steekt. En dat is, dat is echt ook uh, bijna, ja, ja. bijna niet te geloven eigenlijk. Nee. Hoe dat, uh, ja. hoe dat mensen willen ook, je merkt vaak dat het staat op, op weerstand of gewoon ontkennen. Van, nee, het kan niet dat daar een klein clubje bedrijven is die al het geld maken en dat wij niet alleen als individuen, maar ook als bedrijven en zelfs als overheid, dat wij die banken moeten lenen. Terwijl die banken dat letterlijk uit het niets maken. Dus ja, dat vind ik super scheef. Nou, we zien hier de plattegrond van Arnhem. Dit is een beetje het centrum van de stad. We hebben hier het modekwartier. En uh, ja, je ziet dat uh, de bitcoin-acceptanten zitten verspreid, maar met name in het centrum hebben we een enorme grote hoeveelheid bitcoin-acceptanten. Kun je zonder euro's gewoon uh, een week een leuke tijd hebben in Arnhem? Dan vermaak je je uitermate goed, ja. Je kan overnachten, je hebt vrije tijdsbesteding, je kan het wijnmuseum bijvoorbeeld, en bolen. Ja, er zijn al verschillende uh, toeristen geweest, eigenlijk bitcoin-toeristen. Die speciaal naar Arnhem zijn gekomen omdat ja, we hier iets hebben opgezet waarmee je gewoon met gemak een, een weekend een hele leuke tijd kan hebben en alleen maar bitcoins kan, uh, kan uitgeven. Hoe is het verder? Lang neergestormd met de betalingen geloof ik? Nee, dat valt wel mee. Er zijn wel enkele mensen geweest die hebben betaald met, uh, met de bitcoin. Ja, dat kan maar wel ja, wat meer geloof ik. Altijd, altijd. Ja. Eigenlijk liever wat meer als met pinautomaat, maar ja, dat is afwachten allemaal. Hè? Weet je, iedereen is verkikkerd op die, die pinautomaat of dat pinpasje. Maar iedereen die loopt met een smartphone. En als je die banken dan neemt, die nemen gewoon te veel geld voor alles. Dus je moet die pinautomaat moet je huren of kopen. Je moet bundels kopen. En dan de stortingen moet je betalen. Al die dingen, als je dat allemaal bij elkaar optelt, dat kost gewoon te veel geld. En u als ondernemer krijgt dus bitcoins. Ja. Maar u krijgt via bitkassensysteem krijgt u euro's uitbetaald. Ja. En wanneer zou u ervoor kiezen, denkt u om die bitcoins te houden en te zeggen, ik hoef ze niet omgewisseld te hebben in euro's, ik hou ze wel als bitcoins. Als het echt daadwerkelijk omslaat. Dus dat, het echt, dat je ook echt in de gaten krijgt van jongens, hey, nou gaat er echt een, 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 een sneeuwbal rollen, dus dat die meer wordt. En dan ben je eigenlijk van, nou, nou gaat het lukken en dan gaan we gewoon verder, dan ga ik gewoon verder. Deze studenten die hebben van de hand allemaal bitcoins gekregen en vanavond gaan we die uitdelen. Ja? Nou, ik verstuur nu die bitcoins en dan zou het bij jullie allemaal tegelijk moeten binnenkomen. Nu onderweg. Binnen? 12, 79? En wat is het verschil volgens jullie met uh, de euro? Uh, dat er ja. veel meer heen en weer gaat. Dat... Ja. ja. Je weet eigenlijk niet echt wat je hebt in principe. Zoals nu hadden we net hadden we 12, 69, nu hebben we 12, 72. Beside the ease of use, the Arnhem students have also noticed a less pleasant quality to bitcoins. The fluctuating exchange rate compared to other currencies which could make a beer a couple of cents cheaper or more expensive between ordering and serving. So Bitcoin, in my, my, my definition, is not money. The key to something being money, uh, in my opinion, is that it's a widely used unit of account, meaning that goods and services are priced in it. So when you go to the coffee shop, you see something priced in Bitcoin. That's not true. There are coffee shops where there are prices in Bitcoin, but that price is changing constantly based on the currency it's linked to. So the pound, for example, here in England lost 20% of its value recently, but the price of coffee didn't change. It was still 99p. That's what it means to be a unit of account, and Bitcoin is not that. The price adjusts based on its exchange rate continuously. Do you see Bitcoin as a form of money or as a digital gold? So I, I see gold as money, and I see Bitcoin as having all the same properties of gold, with one property that, actually a couple properties that are even better. So gold is kind of hard to divide. Bitcoin divides down to eight decimal points instantly, super easily. 
gold is really, really difficult to transport. If I want to transport gold from here to Moscow, it'll cost a bunch of money to do that, and it's dangerous, and you have to have armed guards, and who knows what. With Bitcoin, I can send Bitcoin from here to Moscow or, or to Holland instantly, just like that, basically for free. I don't have to pay for a bunch of armed guards. It just happens almost like magic. If you ever ask somebody why they think gold's valuable, they can't ever really tell you. They always give you these like, weird stories around, oh, it's like a precious metal, isn't it? It's, it's pretty. While we think it has all this intrinsic value, this intrinsic value of gold has been largely constructed uh, in people's heads, often by actually like association with power, association with religious figures. Um, Bitcoin um, has potential for similar types of construction. You could create this, this sense of this uh, almost like a commodity-like token um, that has no immediate sort of uh, value to it, but can be imbued with value. Right. As more people start to mine, it, it, they become harder and harder to find. So it's kind of been a, uh, I correlate it to like an arms race, right? The guy with the biggest gun wins at this point. So this is um, the newest place we've started working on here. This is a place in the mountains in China. It's um, cool and it doesn't rain that much so we can cool it very efficiently. How much do you pay for that electricity on a daily basis? Um, all in, all of my mines together, we're probably paying about $100,000, maybe a little bit more. A day? Yeah. <laughs> You're paying $100,000 oh, a day? I'm sorry, that's per month, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay. But uh, Bitcoin in general, uh, all myself and all my, my colleagues combined, it's about a million dollars a day in power. In power consumption. Yeah. And you guys generate what worth of coins? Uh, we're generating, uh, of course, it depends on the price, right? Mm -hmm. But the uh, market price? Right, uh, so we'll just say for $250. Uh, we'll just put the price at $250 for easy numbers. Um, you're finding roughly around 25 bitcoins every 10 minutes. So you just take that and times it by an hour. So you're finding around 150 bitcoins an hour. Take that times 24, and then you do that times 250. Do some back of that. So we're making about $900,000 per day. So a lot of people ask, how is that possible? And the, the reality is a lot of the Chinese guys, they are mining at a negative profit. Uh, one of my friends in Beijing, I, let, I met him last month. I met him up again, and I asked him, Last time I checked, man, your power was pretty expensive. Why are you still mining? And his only words were, I can't stop. So what do you mean you can't stop? You're losing money. He's like, well, I can't. I have all these, you know, pieces of equipment and I just can't stop. It's gold fever, right? That's right. And it's interesting because a lot of the, a lot of my colleagues don't see it as a business subconsciously, right? They kind of get addicted to it and kind of get crazy about it.好,现在看到的就是我们那个长城镇的机房,这是我们大连的一号机房,现在有三层楼,我们使用的就是第二层。我们每天的产品量,像这个,这种规模的产品量大概是在二十到二十五个币之间,大概有三千台左右。那员工
And a lot of people who got into the first year of Bitcoin actually had mental breakdowns. It was so beautiful. It was like you're seeing, you know, some of the most remarkable art ever for the first time. One of the qualities that I don't like about the community is that it's extremely absolutist. It's very politically led and it assumes that its political ideology is the correct one and it kind of thrusts its political ideology on everybody else. So I always say, you know, I don't want political ideology when I'm paying for my coffee. I just want a payment network that works and that allows me to benefit from smooth transactions. Lots of paper money. So this is a receipt and this is my public address and private key. You got it covered for us so we cannot film it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Bitcoin. Over the past two years, new members are increasingly joining the Bitcoin community, not for ideological reasons, but for practical ones. In Kiev, there are some protests happening. So people started using social media to share their QR code. Within a matter of days, they automatically had $15,000 in their wallets uh, from sympathizers to the protests. That money was transferred from around the world. It's an incredibly powerful example because today I spent seven years in, in Nicaragua and today I still cannot use PayPal to transfer money to my friends in Nicaragua. Whether or not Bitcoin will be worth millions isn't the main question for many computer scientists, investors and hackers. To them, Satoshi Nakamoto's real invention is the blockchain technology, a global open ledger which can be used to share much more than just money. You may think that Bitcoin is just another way to pay for a cup of coffee, but it's not. Bitcoin is just the denomination used to pay the toll to put stuff on this global ledger. Now, if you think about it, timestamp recordings of deaths, births, uh, property, transactions, votes, this is the entire fabric of our civilization which makes the blockchain one of the most profound human innovations of our time, because having a massive global ledger as a public utility can completely reorganize the way that we run our societies. Fundamentally, blockchain is a database sort of mechanism, and it's a standard, it's a protocol. And one of the problems we have in an increasingly glo globalized system is that everyone is operating their systems on their own local standards. Um, and getting people to do everything in a uniform way that benefits all of us, like, you know, bringing in the metric system, that is really, really hard. Blockchain offers an opportunity to start this new, exciting technological, uh, you know, industry from a standard that is globalized and potentially uniform. So I see the potential that way. The decentralized blockchain makes it possible to share data publicly without a single party controlling the system. In the blockchain, all participants in the network are equal. Maybe inventor Satoshi Nakamoto saw Bitcoin as just the first experiment with this form of digital democracy. I think blockchain technology is really authentically fascinating. Like I think it's anybody who ignores it and, and writes it off is probably making a mistake. I think it's definitely not going to get a, it's not going to get smaller. But to this day, the true identity of the architect behind this revolutionary technology remains a mystery. You know, we can't ask Satoshi questions, which is really frustrating, right? Um, but it's also, again, part of, I think, the magic of Bitcoin is that, you know, we can all kind of imagine this technology, you know, for, you know, as we see it, um, rather than just as Satoshi did. So it could be used in this way, even if Satoshi didn't intend it to, intend it to be this widely worldwide distributed thing. I, I, think, I think Satoshi probably did, but, um, you know, it still could be that, and uh, we, can, we can make it that. Satoshi around here somewhere in Tokyo? <laughs> yeah, I think I see him right there. <laughs> oh, that's a question I get a lot, actually. Um, a lot of people have asked me who Satoshi is since I got in so early. Um, I think I've got a pretty good idea, but I like to keep that one close to my chest, so. Why? I mean, <laughs> tell me. Because um, I'm not 100% certain, and the reality is it doesn't really matter. 
right? And it doesn't matter who Satoshi is, because um, now it's kind of grown beyond uh, like a pet project, right? But I mean, he owns Satoshi. Owns how much? How many coins? I think he's got about five hundred thousand locked up. With his blockchain technology, inventor Satoshi Nakamoto has completely relinquished his control of Bitcoin. But he does own one twentieth of all Bitcoins himself. So if one day Bitcoin does become widely accepted as a currency, he will be one of the richest people on Earth. People might find that scary, a new currency or a system based on an inventor who owns already, well, one twentieth of, of, of all the currency he invented. Yeah. Isn't that a problem? A Satoshi invented one of the most important inventions in the entire history of humankind that's going to improve the lives of everybody on the planet for the better. If he had half of all the bitcoins, he would still deserve it. Who do you think Satoshi is? I think it's probably a band of people who decided that a nom de plume was the best way to go precisely because if it did take off, there would be too many consequences uh, for an individual, one person, or even a group of people. And from my perspective, you never make a move of this sort without a myth. You need a sort of foundation myth. Every good sort of system of power has a foundation myth, and it's always best if the, if the leader is either anonymous or aloof or in some way uh, distant from the public, because you, you have to create a sort of mythology around him. And because Satoshi, nobody knows who he is. Um, you know, this, if we knew who he was, it would almost, it would almost ruin the whole thing for, for everybody, I think. Why did he disappear, you think? Uh, he undermined the ability of every single government on the entire planet to control the money supply. And that's how every single government in the world is controlling their citizens and their economies today. And he just basically, you know, knocked their feet right out from under them with the invention of Bitcoin. And uh, I'm sure that's going to make a lot of people who want to control other people by force really, really upset. So yeah, I think it's really, really smart for him to have uh, disappeared. And for me, it probably would have been smarter for me to keep quiet too, but Bitcoin's too exciting for me to, to stay quiet about. I think a lot of people are underestimating the way in which Bitcoin and the blockchain are going to change the power structures in society in general. I mean, I grew up in the US and uh, I see all these people like, yeah, nuke everybody in the Middle East and kill them all. And then they have the former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, on 60 Minutes, one of the most popular news shows in the US. And they asked her, they said like, there's reports that more than half a million Iraqi children have died as a direct result of US sanctions. And she looks back at her with a straight face and she goes, it was a really tough decision but I think that it was worth it. Worth murdering half a million kids because of what the government did? And I apologize for crying, but it just disgusts me from my core when I see government people murdering people around the world. It's not just theoretical. These are real people with real lives. And it's real people. And Bitcoin has the power to undermine everything they're doing to people around the world. And I'm sorry for shouting, but it just disgusts me what these people in government do. And they do it through central banking and through the control of the money supply, and Bitcoin takes that away from them.